You know, one of the things that causes a lot of pain in people's lives is when people have bit into deception. You know, you might feel like you're being deceived by the government or uh, deceived by, by news networks and some even deceived by the church. Well, today on Daily Renewal, I want to talk to you about how not to be deceived. Hello everybody, this is Pastor Lyle and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, I just want to I encourage you to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel, hitting that like button below and ringing that bell, and that will give you access to over a hundred different uh, Daily Renewal broadcasts that are all designed to help you in your Christian walk. I want to start off today by talking about an interesting phenomenon I'm seeing in the news. Now, uh, it seems to be that uh, there's usually two camps in this situation, uh, and I'm talking in regards to uh, how people are dealing with some of the decisions that are being made about quarantine. On one side, you've got people that are saying, this is so wrong that we're, the government is lifting this quarantine. All the scientists and the news networks, they're saying that, that we should stay locked down, and when we don't, uh, they're gonna. They're, we're putting lives in danger, and then you've got the other side that says, "Hey, the government needs to hurry up and open this thing up." And and we can't believe all these news networks because uh, you know the, the, it's perfectly safe, and we need to get the economy going. You know, you can argue whichever side you want, but one thing that I will uh, say I've observed about this is both sides of that argument believe that somebody is trying to pull the wool over their eyes. In other words, somebody's trying to deceive them. And you know, if it's one thing that I've realized is when somebody deceives another person, uh, you know, if you're the one being deceived, uh, it causes a lot of different emotions to stir within you. You know, when somebody doesn't treat you properly, maybe you've had a friend that betrayed you, and we've all probably had that once, twice, or a million times. Uh, you tend to pull away. You you feel like you've been cheated. And, and, and when you've been deceived by somebody, the last thing you want to do is, is, is be nice about it. You want to, you, you want to get away. You want to, you, you feel sometimes we, you feel like a fool for, for biting into it. And, you know, many people say, you know what? I am never going to fall for that again. There's a lot of things that happen to us when we realize that we've bitten into something that turned out to be wrong. Well, that's where it brings me to my subject today. I want to talk to you about the church today. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to the word church, they, they've got many different ideas about the church. I've met many people that say, you know what? I can hardly wait until the church gets back into, into the way that it used to be. Well, here's a news flash for you. That will probably never happen. It'll probably never go back to the way that it used to be. And in a lot of ways, that's a good thing. And I'll submit to you this. That's a God thing. Uh, but there's a lot of people that I, I've met that, you know what? They maybe used to go to church or they knew people who go, went to church. And they say, you know what? I wouldn't dare darken the doors of a church because I've had bad experiences in church. Well, I can tell you right now that I've been a pastor for over 20 years and I've had some really terrible experiences in church. But the difference is between myself and somebody who maybe doesn't go anymore is I understand that it is Jesus who orchestrated the church. It's God's idea. Jesus says he is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, Pastor Lyle, I believe in that kind of church, but I don't believe in organized religion. Well, I'm going to have a hard time getting around that one too when we look at passages such as Ephesians where it talks about the fivefold ministry, the office of the apostle, pastor, prophet, evangelist, and teacher. And some say, oh, well, those aren't for today. Well, my question would be, which ones? <laughs> and I won't go into too much of that today and because uh, that's another message for another day. I believe that, that God, uh, I believe in the fivefold ministry. But I want to uh, focus a little bit more today on this idea of deception in church. Can there be deception in church? Well, you know, I don't have to look very far. I mean, uh, on a Sunday morning, 
uh, such as today, uh, on my Facebook feed, I uh, noticed there's all kinds of different preachers you can listen to. Because the churches are closed, everybody's doing stuff online. And it is amazing how, how confusing it can be. Somebody is not hearing from God. And I can tell you how I know that. You've got some preachers that are saying, well, this thing that we're going through, this is the judgment of God. And then you've got the others that are saying, saying, no, this is the devil. And we just need to come against it. We just need to speak against it because we've got all this authority and, and we just need to come against it. You know, I look at both of these views and they're very flawed. I'll tell you what I know about it is whether it was God or whether it was the devil God knew exactly what was coming and he knows exactly how to get us through. Now, what it, what getting through looks like is also quite a bit different to a lot of the churches in the church world today. Many believe that, you know what, when we come through, the church is going to be even better than ever. We're going to have bigger buildings and all of this stuff. And, and you know, there's another camp that says, you know what, when we get through this, uh, the idea of getting through it should be, uh, and, and I look at it kind of like this, that there's something to be learned by going through the situation we're going through right now. You know, I really believe that uh, the trials that we come, uh, that come upon us, that we come into, uh, we have to understand that there isn't a trial in our lives that God hasn't already foreseen. And his desire is to mold and shape us to be more like Jesus. Jesus didn't just come and set up shop and, and have the, the, the shiniest show in town and, 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 and just, just to show that Christianity was the best thing going. No, basically Jesus came here and he suffered and died and he paid a price. Uh, to see Christianity, not just birth, and we see even with the, the, uh, in the New Testament, all the early followers, they went through excruciating circumstances. And now we look at that, and this is our example. We need to understand that there's things in our lives that we're going to go through that are tough. And one of the tough things that we go through is when our belief system is challenged. And if you take it a step further, when our belief system is challenged, and we find that it isn't working. Now, does that mean Christianity doesn't work? Absolutely not. The truest form of Christianity, when we follow Jesus by his word, he will uh, bring us through all the things that the enemy will try to bring at us. So let's talk a little bit about this. Can there be deception? Is, you know, do I go to a church that, that, that is deceptive? Well, I'm going to tell you that it was predicted uh, in the New Testament, all through the New Testament, that we need to be watchful. It's very important that we are watchful because of the fact that it was predicted that there would be false teachers, false prophets. You could go through all of the fivefold ministry listed in, in uh, Ephesians and understand that what Satan does is he takes what God has orchestrated and he twists it. In other words, uh, he makes a copy of it, but it, it's uh, a copy that is to bring deception. So the idea of him bringing in church leaders that are uh, uh, preaching things that are getting people off track is predicted. We see here Paul speaking to his young protege, Timothy, in his second letter, uh, chapter 4, what we know as chapter 4, starting in verse 2, he says to Timothy, he says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. In other words, you're going to have to convince people. You're going to have to teach people. And it's not going to be easy. He says, for the time will come. Speaking of the time times that are before us. He says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Doctrine being teaching. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. It's really important that we have to understand that this idea of teaching that is just, uh, uh, it talks about itching ears, but teaching that is based upon our own desires, we have to really analyze. We'll probably get a little further into that in a few moments. Now, the second uh, thing that I want to bring up about the last days and false teachers, uh, there was a, a warning as well in, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, 
Paul says this. He says, uh, he says, for I know this, that after my departure, and he's speaking to the church here, he says, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Even back here in, in Paul's day, he's warning that there's people that are even among you that will rise up with improper motives and bring false teaching to try and, and either drive their own popularity. Now, they don't realize that they're actually uh, being influenced uh, not by the Spirit of God, by other spirits to do so. They may think they're doing the right thing. And I know many well-meaning people that are operating in wrong spirits that are deceiving people. So we see here that it's, it's clear, and there's many more scriptures that, that go along this line, that we have to be aware in this day that false teaching, false apostles, false preachers, all of these things, they are uh, they are going to be potentially among us. Uh, we also see the idea of deception uh, when we uh, look at a scripture in Matthew 7. Now, in Matthew 7, this is a troubling scripture for a lot of people uh, that, that proves uh, the direction I'm going uh, that I just mentioned to you. It says this in verse 21. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now listen to this. Many will say to me in that day. What day? The day where they meet with him face to face. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you, you who practice lawlessness. So we see here, there's many people, or there's a group of people that is going to stand before the Lord one day and think they've done all these great things for God, but God is going to look at them and say, no, you did nothing for me. I don't even know who you are. You, you, for whatever reason, either wrong motive or whatever, but you didn't carry out what I had planned for your life the way that I designed for it to be planned. And we have to understand, each and every one of us, God has a plan for each and every one of us to walk out. And as we stay close to Jesus, he will uh, help us walk out this plan. You know, these people that he's talking about here, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're worried, you're thinking, well, Pastor Lau, you know, what if I walk out of the plan? This sounds pretty tough. Well, I can guarantee you that God will give you every opportunity and he will speak to you at every, uh, at every, every opportunity that he has. He will direct you. He'll try to direct you. I really believe that this is people who may, uh, who've really just bit into their own desires and, you know, they did it in the name of serving God. Don't worry. If you are somebody who's doing your best just to walk with Jesus, it's not really easy to fall out of the plan of God for your life. You just have to stay close to him. So I want to talk more about uh, some of the mindsets that we need to have if we are going to get through some of this deception. Now, I say this, I'm coming from the point where I could tell you after being a pastor for over 20 years, there's been times where I have bit into deception. Early in my Christian walk, there's been many times where I, I, I listen to a lot of TV preachers and, and, and am I saying they're all bad? No, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this, that we need to be very careful who we get our spiritual, uh, spiritual teaching from. We have to be aware uh, we have to constantly be in a place where we are learning and we are checking what we believe. Now, th there's a lot of times where people say, well, you know, I don't need to do that. I come from a good church and, and you know what, I might, might be off on some things and that's okay. Well, that's not how we need to approach things. See, when it comes to God, the way that we have to look at this is I want to please God with everything I do. I, for me, I, I look at what God has done for me. I remember what it was like before I knew Jesus, how wretched my life was. 
And, and you know, even today, without him, without leaning and trusting on Jesus, my life would be a mess. But, you know, as I continue to walk with him every day and I continue to, to make the decision that I want to develop my relationship with Jesus, and part of that development is me looking at my own life, analyzing it and putting it up to the word of God and seeing, is there parts of this that, that I need to adjust in my life? And one of the key things that, uh, uh, as far as a, 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 a piece of advice for you that I do is I look at this in my own life, but I also look at this when I, I'm looking at some of the, the men and women of God that, that I, I allow to speak into my life, whether it's mentors or pastors that, that, I, that I look to for advice. One of the key things that I've learned over the years is, you know what? I know a lot of people that can preach a real good message. But if you really want to see a difference in your life, you need to find people that actually live the message. People that you can see, this is working. And I want to be one of those people. And, and so one of the litmus tests to see whether this is working, we find in the book of Galatians. Uh, in, in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and this is often referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. And... Uh, it says this, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, when I'm analyzing my life, I find that if, I'm, if there's times in my life where maybe self-control, where I'm having trouble with that. I used to have a lot of, of addictions in my life, especially when I was younger. And uh, I also found that when I became a Christian, I got rid of some of those addictions and I picked up some new ones. Anything in your life that has a hold of you to the point where you can't put it off to the side, we need to analyze and allow God into that area of our life because it's, it's proof that we're lacking self-control in an area. Uh, so anyway, uh, we look at the idea of, um, uh, of self-control, but also the idea of how we handle uh, trials and tribulations. That goes along with long suffering. You know, for some of you, maybe you're not very patient at this time. You're finding your patience is wearing thin. Well, that could be an indication that you need to get closer to Jesus and allow him to work in areas of your life that might have been strong before, but for whatever reason, they've been worn down. When I realize or when I see that there's some things involving the fruit of the Spirit, my love level, my joy level, my peace level, uh, my patience level, my kindness level, uh, my goodness level, faithfulness level, gentleness level, my self-control, when I see any of those that, that seem to be, that I'm struggling with, I always have to say, okay, Lord, show me, help me get back into your presence, help me get back to the place where these things can be continually developed. And ultimately, the Lord is the one who exemplifies all these things in their fullest. So as you get closer to Jesus, you will see these things flourish in your life. So the second thing that uh, we should be checking constantly is do we have a love for God's word? You know, I know a lot of people, they love going to church. They love worshiping God. They love singing. They love being on the worship team. They love serving and all those things. But really, when it comes right down to it, we have a great example in the Psalms, Psalm 119, 47, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. You know, I noticed that for myself, one of the key components in me moving ahead spiritually is me spending time and, and enjoying God's word. You know, if you're finding that there's times where the world is creeping in and things are creeping in so much that you're, you're, you're not spending time in his word, you'll also find that, that it's really a hindrance. It's a hindrance to your walk. We have to be people that enjoy going to his word. And I'll tell you this, that when we become people that, that have a love for God's word, then what happens is as we continue to spend time in it, it's like drinking a cold glass of water on a hot day. So I want to continue to, to look at, at this in my life and, I, and ask you know, if, if for you, take a look once in a while. Do you have a real love for God's word? Are you spending time in it? Do you enjoy his word? 
And then that brings me to uh, the third one. And that is uh, seen in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, 18. It says here, But we all with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. See, we, th this image that he's talking about, this same image, is the image of Jesus. We have to understand that we're all being transformed into the image of Jesus. When, when you uh, make a decision to follow Christ, uh, the Bible says that, you're, that, that you are born again. Your spirit man comes alive and you are born again. But from there... Uh, we also notice that not everything uh, gets smoothed out. There's still things in your walk that, 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 uh, that you're having trouble with at times. And that's because there is a process. And we see here that we are still being transformed. So our spirit is alive, but our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And I encourage you, uh, take a look at some of our previous broadcasts of Daily Renewal, where we talk about uh, the restoration of the soul. Your spirit, you're saved, but your soul is being transformed. How? To look like him. The Holy Spirit transforms us so that we are more like Jesus. So when we look at our lives, we have to acknowledge uh, if there's times where, where, you know what? We're just not, don't look like Jesus. Where I seem to be going backwards instead of forwards. Well, that is something we need to analyze. And if we aren't being transformed, we need to ask ourselves why. And that's where I come to the next set of, of things I want to talk about. And that is, how do we escape deception? Well, the first thing we have to do in escaping deception uh, is quit drinking the Kool-Aid. What does that mean? Well, if you're eating something poisonous, you don't keep eating it. Now, this might sound simple, but I'm going to tell you, it's not as simple as you may think. There's a lot of times, and I've even experienced this as a pastor, where uh, you've been tempted or I've been tempted to compromise because of the repercussions of, uh, of not going in a certain direction. You know, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to put this to, out to you. It says this starting in verse 11. And this is the New Testament. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about the fact that, you know, you, you can't judge people. You, know, you, know, you, know, you can't talk bad about the church and all this stuff. Well, let me show you what Apostle Paul talks about here. He says, but I have now written to you not to keep company with anybody named a brother. Now, if you translate this, this can also be translated who calls himself a brother. It says, don't keep company with anyone who calls himself a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous. Uh, covetous means greedy as well. Uh, or an idolater, somebody who serves false gods or has idols, uh, who is a reviler, uh, that's somebody who is a slanderer uh, or uses verbally abusive language. Uh, uh, the next one is, or a drunkard, that one's pretty self-explanatory, or an extortioner, uh, that can be broken down into a swindler, somebody who cheats people, uh, uh, a robber, or somebody who's dishonest. It says, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those uh, also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. Well, let me break this down on what this is saying. This is not saying that we that it's okay to judge people. In fact, what it's saying is, if there's somebody who's not a believer, we shouldn't judge them. But if there's somebody who calls themselves a believer, and they are participating in these things, and I'll qualify by saying, I believe this is participating in these things without any form of repentance. In other words, not even acknowledging them. That we are not even to eat with them. We're to put away from ourselves the evil person. This is somebody who calls himself a brother. And Paul says, somebody who calls himself a brother, he says they are an evil person. Wow, that won't preach in a lot of churches today. 
because we just have to accept everybody. We have to accept everybody's doctrines. We have to accept everybody's belief. And you know, that might not be what you believe, but this is what I believe. Hey, Paul was, was a lot harder on this than I tell you I am. And, and I really got convicted about this spirit or this, this particular portion of scripture a few years ago. God challenged me on this. And uh, that doesn't mean that we don't show mercy. But when I look at some of these things, some of these things, even the world looks at the church and they say, hey, this is stuff I see happening in the church world. Is there sexual immorality going on in the church? Yep, I've seen it happen many times. Uh, is there covetousness? Is there greediness going on in the church? Well, uh, uh, there's a lot of guys you can go online and, and you can see that, you know, during the, the this particular situation where finances are tough, I know guys that are asking and saying, you know what, you need to give even more. Stick it to the devil. Okay, whatever. Let's continue. Uh, what about an idolater? Somebody who has false gods or idols. You'd be absolutely amazed how many idols uh, an idolatry has entered even the evangelical church. So we need to be careful. A reviler, again, somebody who's verbally abusive. Uh, I know many times that I, I, I've seen lots of preachers, for example, that have uh, spiritually abused people verbally from behind the pulpit. Does that happen today? Absolutely it does. Uh, hopefully not at your church. Uh, the other one, a drunkard. Yeah, you probably say that one too. An extortioner. Well, do I really need to go any further on whether there's been extortion that's gone on in church? These are all things that if these things are going on, if we have people or churches that are participating in these kind of things, it's Paul says here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not only are we not supposed to eat with them, but we are to put away from ourselves the evil person. Well, Pastor Lyle, you know, you can't mean, you, you, you can't mean, uh, you know, certain preachers. You can't mean this guy. He's my favorite. I mean, you, 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 we can't just call them evil. Paul calls this kind of stuff evil. And you know what? I, if the Bible says that God, that Jesus is returning for a church without spot or wrinkle. Now, for me, as a pastor, I'll tell you, I've looked at this and I go, you know what? If there's areas of this in my life I have to be somebody that is at least looking into these things. And if these areas are in my life, I need to do my absolute best to, to, to allow God to straighten these things out in my life. And so, so when I look at this, uh, we have to understand that we can't just say, oh, well, you know, our church is pretty good. We're only, you know, how many is there here? Uh, uh, one, two, three four, five, six. Our church is only, is one for six. We're doing pretty good. No, with anything to do with God, don't be satisfied uh, with anything but God's best. And so, uh, you know, as I look at this, understand that if this is the kind of stuff that is going on, you have to uh, make a decision between what God asks you to do and Maybe what you've done is tradition for a long time, and it won't be easy. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But you have to make a decision not to drink the Kool-Aid. Don't continue to ingest the poison. The longer you do it, the closer you get to death. And I'm going to tell you, after years of doing this, I've seen many people that have sat in church for 50 years, however long, multiple years, and they still don't have victory in a lot of areas of their lives. And they've never gotten to the point where they understand maybe, just maybe, it has something to do with some of the teaching I've received over the years. Now, the second thing that you need to have in place if you're going to uh, escape deception is you need to ask yourself, who am I walking with? Now, I often refer to Proverbs 27, uh, 17, where it talks about uh, iron sharpens iron friend. Now, I've made sure in my life that I've had people around me who can speak into my life 
and, uh, and people who, who obviously I speak into their lives as a pastor, but developing real solid friendships, not just friendships where, where people, you know, just coddle you and say, and tell you you're doing great all the time. No, friendships that, that have my back, friendships that maybe know me well enough to know maybe when something's wrong and they're willing to, 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 to say something at a time when, they, when I really need to hear it. Um, that type of friendship is really important. But often what happens when you've been hurt by church, when I, and I've seen many people like this, they choose to, to, to say, you know what, I'm just going to do this by myself. I'm tired of organized religion. I'm tired of all this stuff. I'm just going to walk with Jesus by myself. That is the worst thing you could do. God has made this very clear that for all of us, we, you know, there's relationships that he's put us together with to help us. If you're trying to fight on your own, you will not be successful. Now, the next one I want to bring up today, uh, you'll find in 1 Samuel 15, and it's the story of King Saul, different than Apostle Paul, King Saul. And you know what King Saul did? is uh, God explained to him that he wanted him to do something and he wanted it done a specific way. And what Saul did is he actually did something that looked very spiritual. He sacrificed some animals and made it look like he was doing it as, as under, under the Lord. And that's not what God asked him to do. But he felt pressured by the people. And, and that brings me to my point. If you're going to get out of deception, you have to be somebody that makes a decision to walk in obedience rather than just sacrifice. You know, we have to find out what does God say about our situations? And again, that comes back to what I was talking about earlier. Do you have a love for the scriptures? You know, I know a lot of people that serve God with all their heart and, and, and they mean well, but the idea of just meaning well, isn't good enough. There's been a lot of people with good intentions. You can see this all through the Bible. There was a time where, where David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, in, in, into Jerusalem, and he was, he was dancing before the Lord, and he, was, and, he, and he was bringing it in, but he was bringing it in on a way, a man-made cart that he thought was a great idea, and it was, a, it was something, a, a way that the Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to be carried. And, uh, and through the journey, the cart began to, to or the, the Ark of the Covenant began to fall, and one of the guys, that was trying to uh, trying to uh, pull the cart, put his hand on it, and he died instantly. And David was upset. He meant well, but you know what? The bottom line is he violated the way that God asked him to do that. You know, we can sacrifice a lot of things for God, but if you, we are not obedient to God, all of our sacrifices don't mean anything. Now, the last one that I want to talk to you about is the fact that we need to be willing to adjust when God speaks. And we see a great example of this in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 9, I want to lay out the story for you. It's the story of Apostle Paul, who was actually named Saul at this point. Again, not, not King Saul in the Old Testament, but his name was Saul. And who he was, is he was a guy, a young, younger guy, and he, he, was, he was one of the best uh, of the best. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had made his way up in the religious order. Uh, he had lots of accolades. He was somebody that was basically uh, commissioned to go out and round up all of these, these Christians, because these Christians were really causing a problem in Jewish culture. Uh, so what happened was, is uh, he was actually at the point where he was rounding them up and, and many of them were killed. And he actually held the clothes of, uh, of Stephen when Stephen was stoned to death. So here he is, he's in, in great opposition to Christianity. And here, so we pick this story up in uh, the book of Acts in chapter 9. And uh, we see here in uh, verse 3, he says, it says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the, then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want? Uh, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, "Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do." 
And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from uh, the ground and went, uh, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, this sounds like a pretty easy decision for, for, for Saul or Paul at the time. But let me tell you, uh, let me explain to you what happened here. Jesus, just like with you and I, he will do everything possible to get the message of directing us to where he wants us to go to us. Now, often there's times where God might speak fairly clearly, but we don't, you know, maybe we're slow to hear. I can attest to that. There's been times where I felt like I've been slow to hear, but God has been so merciful that he found a way to get me where I'm supposed to be. So be comforted in that. But I'm going to tell you that this was not easy for Saul. And this is why. When he got knocked off that horse and he was confronted by Jesus saying, hey, you're persecuting me. It was at that time that he realized he had a decision to make. And that decision involved making a decision to walk with what he knew to be true. And that's follow Jesus' direction. Or, and with that, he would have to give up his livelihood. He would have to give up a lot of family members. He'd have to give up his notoriety. He'd have to give up everything that he had. He would be shunned from all the people that he that, that, that thought he was all that, that thought he was a great Pharisee. There was so many things that he would have to give up. Paul still had to make the, the decision. Saul, Paul had to make the decision on whether he was going to continue going the direction he was going or whether he was going to go where Jesus told him to go. And by doing that, he had to let go of everything. He had to let people direct him. He was blind. He couldn't even see. He was totally dependent on, on being directed by God. And, and not only that, but Jesus directed him to a bunch of Christians, people that he was persecuting, to lay hands on him and his sight recovered and it was at that point that one of the greatest ministries in the entire history of the planet began. But it began with a man willing to adjust his way of thinking when God spoke to him. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty easy. If Jesus knocks me off a horse, uh, yo, I'm probably going to listen. I can tell you right now, there's many circumstances in our lives where we come to a crossroad and we have to decide, am I going to go God's direction or am I going to go the comfortable direction? Because God's direction is often not comfortable. In, in fact, very often not comfortable. But I'll tell you what's more uncomfortable. It's more uncomfortable the day you have to stand before Jesus and make an account for the directional decisions you didn't make when he made them fairly clear. Now, sometimes it might not seem clear. But again, I've realized in my life that if God wants me to do something, I want to go the direction of God. And he will be gentle. He will be merciful. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to go, you know, uh, one direction. And I mean, it can happen, but one direction and your life is absolutely changed to the, for the worse forever. No, while we are here, Jesus gives us opportunity through repentance to continue to walk with him. But we have to humble ourselves and we have to be willing to adjust our lifestyle uh, to go his way. Now, I've seen many times, I've been tempted myself in, in am I going to trust God for finances? You know, when I started this YouTube channel, uh, you know, I had to trust God with things. It seemed like an absolute impossibility to do. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to, I mean, I used to have all my, the guys in the, in the youth ministry I was with, they did everything. And the reason, uh, and uh, really it was a good thing because I was empowering them to do things. That's what a good leader does. But as a result, I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to do anything. I, I mean, I had one guy do all my emails for most of the time because I didn't even know how to do that for a long time. And you know, when God spoke to me about doing this YouTube channel, it was a huge stretch for me. But now as a result, I've had many people that have either phoned me or, or messaged me talking to me about the fact that, 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 you know, on a weekly basis saying, you know what, you said this this week and I want you to know just how much that impacted me. You know, that's not me, but I tell you, I get encouraged by that just like anybody else. God is ultimately the one that does that. But, but, you know, for, for me, there's been times where I've been tempted not to do some of the things that God asked me to do because I know they'll be hard. 
But in every opportunity that I've, I've taken up that mantle and said, you know what, I'm going to do it even though it's tough. Even though people may not like it. Even though people may, may, may not want to be around me anymore and they might say bad things about Pastor Lyle. Guess what? If it's what I really believe that God has asked me to do, I would rather be right in the sight of God than in the sight of men. So as I close today, I just want to leave you with one closing thought. Whatever you compromise to keep, you will lose. Give it all to Jesus. If you really want to find your life, the Bible's very clear. If, if For those that are looking for life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for Jesus' sake and the sake of the gospel, you will truly find it. Well, I hope you got something out of this today. Uh, if you did, I just want to encourage you again, consider becoming a subscriber to my channel. Also, uh, take a look at my Facebook page, Daily Renewal. Uh, I do a lot of shorter messages during the week uh, for those that are maybe looking for something like that as well. Hey, the more the Word of God that you can get in you, uh, the, the better, you're, better off you're going to be. So having said that, I'm looking forward to the next uh, episode of Daily Renewal. God bless you and have a great day.